Daniel Klepner, Klepner, class of 1953, is the Lester Wolf Professor of Physics Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and co-director of the MIT Harvard Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms. His research has made him an authority in areas such as atomic physics, including high precision measurements, quantum optics, and of course, ultra-cold atoms, which I'm interested in hearing about. <laughs> How they differ from cold atoms. Later. <laughs> Professor Kleppner is a member of the National Academies of Science, the Academy of Science Paris, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. He has received a number of distinguished awards in his field, including prizes from the American Physical Society, the American Association of Physics Teachers, the Optical Society of America, as well as the National Academy of Sciences. Professor Kleppner received a prestigious Medal of Science from the President of the United States in 2006 for pioneering studies of the interaction between atoms and light, and most importantly for me, for quote unquote, lucid explanations of physics to non-specialists. <laughs> Along with Harvard physicist Norman Ramsey, he developed the hydrogen maser, an atomic clock of great stability used in radio signaling, radio astronomy, and satellite-based global positioning systems. He is the author of two textbooks and occasional essays in the magazine Physics Today and he has participated in numerous national studies. I've been asked to talk this afternoon about my experience at Williams, so I'd like to talk now about what happened just after I left Williams. And one aspect of my career as a physicist, which to me is sort of a parallel of science. Um, I went to Cambridge University before starting graduate work at Harvard University. At Cambridge University, we have a tutorial system where you meet each week with a tutor. Uh, the first year, my assignment each week was to write an essay about physics, uh, which is a very curious way to learn physics, but it is a good way to learn about writing essays. <laughs> During my second year, I had a tutor who was a young physicist who was working in a new area of physics called atomic beams. He told me about the possibility that you might be able to use this technique to make an atomic clock which was so accurate that you could see the effect of gravity on time. And that idea really gripped me. It's a hard idea to explain, because I'm not talking about the fact that a grandfather clock will run slower if you take it up a mountain, because gravity is less. I'm talking about the fact that time itself is different in different gravitational fields. I didn't do anything about the idea at the time. It was just one of those pieces of information that one pockets. But when I went to Harvard University and started doing research, I joined the experimental group of Norman Ramsey, and he had an idea for a new type of atomic clock. It's been mentioned, the hydrogen maser. And I went to work on trying to develop that idea. And eventually we made the maser, and it worked. And it is, it is the basis of a much better type of atomic clock. Now, it would be fun to talk about life as a graduate student at Harvard and the sort of apprenticeship one learns and how one becomes a physicist, but this isn't the occasion for doing that. Let's just say that I got my PhD, I stayed on as a postdoc and then as assistant professor, um, and my first graduate student at uh, Harvard was Stuart Crampton, who was a Williams graduate, <coughs> who then joined the physics faculty at Williams and uh, later became the provost of Williams and uh, is unfortunately not able to be here today. Um, but um, Williams really helped me twice. It gave me a great foundation and then sent me Stuart Crampton and actually over the years, a couple of other excellent students. Well, as we were working on this clock and before we could make the measurement, the effect was seen in a totally different fashion it was using techniques of nuclear physics by one of uh, the other faculty members at Harvard, Bob Pound, the famous in physics experiment, the Pound-Rebka experiment, which did see the influence of gravity on time, but not with clocks, but with nuclear physics. So the, the uh, aim of our initial goal really was met. Of course, that's a disappointment because you like to be there first. Physicists are as competitive as anyone else, and everyone likes to be first. On the other hand, this was a marvelous experiment the results were as expected. This is a confirmatory experiment. If it had been different, uh, Pound would have gotten the Nobel Prize for that, but in fact, it exhibited something that the theory predicted. Nonetheless, we could do it much better, 
and we went on to work to develop the clock for a, a, a gravitational redshift experiment, as it's called. The space age was just dawning then, and the idea was to put one clock up high in a satellite and another down on Earth. We worked on that and started working with NASA, which is a different world altogether from academic physics, and the experiment got bigger and bigger and bigger in scope. We realized there was something seriously wrong when NASA insisted that the astronauts play a role in taking the data on the experiment. Now, the very good clocks like to, like to be left alone, and one does not um, want anyone monkeying with them, particularly in space. Uh, we considered designing what was called the astronaut button, namely it's a button they could press which wouldn't do any harm. <laughs> But um, Norman Ramsey and I, I eventually withdrew from the experiment. I realized I was going to have to be spending the next five years of my life uh, working on this experiment to meet the, the NASA's very rigorous requirements for engineering and such, um, but that the experiment just wasn't worth that much. Instead, one of our colleagues later did, about 10 years later, put an experiment in a rocket and that uh, it was a wonderful experiment which measured the redshift with great accuracy. That rocket experiment also introduced a new technology for comparing clocks moving at high speeds in space with those on the Earth. Now, one of the things that we had not anticipated when we started out on this line of research was that anything useful would come out of it. Our interest was in Einstein's gravitational theory, his, his general theory of relativity, and a theory that is more remote from everyday activities and the uses of mankind would be difficult to name. Nonetheless, out of that, something very practical did come, which is the global positioning system. The global positioning system is essentially a system of, based on very accurate timing, but underneath it all are atomic clocks which keep the whole system going. Now, we didn't anticipate the global positioning system. Nobody did when we started to work. First of all, the clocks didn't exist, and it's only when the things really come into fruition that you start thinking about possible applications. And also, one did not have um, satellites, and one did not have all the modern technology for electronics communications, but they all came together in this global positioning system, which is now part of our everyday life. In some ways, you can see, if you were looking for your uh, GPS tracker for your car, um, and lots of ways that you can't see. So here is this huge payoff from something which was totally useless. But <laughs> there was even a, uh, a, a more uh, pleasing payoff for me because of its scientific applications. One of the themes which develops in science is the more you work in it is the interconnectedness of different areas of science. And we would not have thought that uh, our experiment on time would have much to do with uh, cosmology, but in fact, it turns out that it does. Because of the existence of these clocks, it was develop possible to develop a new type of radio astronomy. Radio astronomy, astronomy done at long radio wavelengths or microwave wavelengths rather than optical wavelengths. And if you would like to look at something with high resolution on a telescope, you want to make your telescope as big as possible. Well, with the use of atomic clocks, you can make a telescope which is essentially the size of the Earth. You have a receiver on one side of the Earth, a receiver on the other side of the Earth, and then you compare their signals. But to do that, you really need atomic clocks for the timing. So this technology called very long baseline radio interferometry came into existence. And that has given the highest resolution pictures of anything in the universe. Now, right now, there is a new project underway for a very long baseline radio interferometry, which is this. It's been discovered since I was a graduate student or started all this work that the universe is filled with things we did not know about. One of this is a class of objects called black holes the science fiction idea, which turns out to be quite real, are objects which are so dense that the gravitational field is so strong that nothing can escape from it, not even light. Also, it was learned that there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy and probably every large galaxy. 
That was learned actually by uh, Charlie Towns, who invented the laser and the maser, which, from which we got our ideas for the hydrogen maser. The evidence for the black hole is indirect because material that doesn't fall in gets ejected in very strong beams, and these are detectable. But the black hole itself uh, is, so, well, it's beyond observation. But you could look at sort of the rim of it, like the cone of a volcano. Well, there is a project now which will have enough resolution to look at the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's still in progress, but the thought of being able to look at material as it's falling into the black hole is very exciting, and that is new physics, because everyone believes Einstein's theory of gravity for the fields around us, but at very high fields, what's called strong gravity, where quantum effects become important, no one knows quite how things will behave. That is the paradox, which the inconsistency between quantum mechanics and gravity that gave rise to the whole subject, for instance, of string theory. So there is a terra incognito in physics, which needs exploring, and here is a new tool for exploring it. Well, uh, those experiments are going on right now, and I'm very much forward, looking forward to seeing them. But here we have a story of how uh, research on a apparently esoteric problem in, in physics leads on to new physics and to new applications and to a new understanding of nature. Now, this is part of nature, too. You might give some thought to trying to encompass black holes in nature <laughs> because uh, our consciousness does not take us there. <laughs> but it resonates, certainly, with, with your thoughts, which to me are very provocative and interesting about the nature of reality and the reality of nature and our relationship to nature. There are many ways to relate to nature. Um, I relate to nature as a physicist. I feel very privileged to have been a physicist, that, uh, that scientists are privileged in this country because the country does support and appreciate science. And a career as a scientist is, a, I think, an elevated career because of the knowledge that we know that we learn and that the impact that this knowledge has on expanding our nature and expanding uh, the quality of life for everyone, and not to met mention the joys of teaching, which of course are part of it. All of this really came, uh, came about, my career came about, because of the start that I had at Williams and the impact that Williams had on me. I will talk a little bit about that this afternoon, but at least this tells you about sort of one aspect of um, my career in physics. Thank you.